it's pretty disgusting that we're having to ask just to be treated equally. Um, it's a fight that women all over the world have to partake in every single day, but quite frankly, we're really sick of it. Um, and it's something that now I don't even get disappointed by anymore. I just get angry about because it's, it's time it's 2023. We won the damn Olympic games and we're about to go to the world cup with the team who, who could win. When most people think of Canadian women's soccer, they think of moments like this. 2012 Olympics in London. Uh, this was the Canadian women up against France. And the game winner, Diana Matheson, uh, in extra time, 92 minutes into the game to secure an Olympic bronze medal. This would be the first one ever for the team. Quite a moment. Fast forward. Four years later, this was uh, in Rio 2016. I remember being in Rio for these games. Christine Sinclair would have the game winner here. Back to back bronze medal performances. And I remember people saying, I think this is it. This is the moment women's soccer in Canada explodes. But then it got even crazier. So 2020 Tokyo, gold medal game. This is against Sweden. It goes to extra time, goes to penalties. And this moment, when the Canadian women knew that they were making history. But here's the problem. In a year where the women have all the momentum in the world, they have an Olympic track record, they have the creation of their very own pro soccer league and a World Cup coming up in less than six months, these are the headlines we're seeing. Canadian women's soccer players outraged and deeply concerned over funding cuts. Canadian women's national soccer team on strike over budget cuts and pay equity. Canadian women end strike, citing threat of legal action from Canada soccer. So today on About That, how did we get from all of that to all of this? The first thing to understand about everything in Canadian soccer boiling over all at once is that it's actually been simmering for years. Canada soccer has a history of not seeing eye to eye with its players. What the heck happened? Uh, all of a sudden people were getting excited for this game today and it's over. What, what, why is this happening? Last summer, in the lead up to a friendly matchup against Panama, negotiations between the men's national team and Canada soccer hit a wall. A moment of joy back in March when Canada clinched a spot in the Men's World Cup for the first time in 36 years. But off the field, a battle over compensation was just beginning. Compensation was a big part of it. And the players were so frustrated that they refused to train in the days leading up to the Panama game. And the game was canceled just hours before kickoff. Canada soccer was not happy. If we as an association only had the men's team and the women's team to take care of and nothing else, no futsal, no beach, no para, no U20, no U17, no U15 on both sides. No coaching development programs, no referee development programs, no national championships. We could still not afford this proposal. It is untenable as written. And now we're seeing a similar story play out with the women. Contract talks have stalled. Their last collective agreement expired more than a year ago. And this year is a big one for them. And now Canada are less than half an hour away to another FIFA Women's World Cup berth. They're heading to the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand this July. And they're good, like really good. Of 187 soccer nations, Canada is ranked number six. Maybe this will be Christine Sinclair's last World Cup. But to prepare, you have to play. What you think? Yeah! This Thursday, the women are scheduled to play in Orlando against the Americans, the number one ranked team in the world. It is a key matchup against the biggest soccer threat there is, but less than a week before kickoff. As a team, we've, we've decided to take job action and from this moment on, we'll not be participating in any Canadian Soccer Association activities until this is resolved. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? That same day, 
an open letter posted on social media. With the biggest tournament in women's football history less than six months away, our preparation for the World Cup and the future success of the women's national team program are being compromised by Canada soccer's continued inability to support its national team. The women's team statement goes on. We have been told quite literally that Canada soccer cannot adequately fund the women's national team and they have waited to tell us this until now. The reality is we showed up to a camp where we're staying in accommodation that's uh, below the standard of accommodation that I personally have stayed in since I've been on the team, which has been quite some time. Um, we've seen a cut in our staff. We don't have as many staff as we have in the past had in camp. Uh, Bev has not been able to bring in as many players as she has wanted to bring into this camp for, um, you know, a, a time period that's an incredibly important period for evaluation for players as we move closer to finalizing a World Cup roster. And while the Canadian women were making the case that they're effectively playing world-class soccer on the cheap, Canada soccer was busy preparing its own statement. We need to have a collective bargaining agreement in place to responsibly plan for the future. We presented an equity-based proposal to our national teams and their council several months ago, and we are still waiting for a definitive response to the terms of that proposal. We want to get this resolved for both of our national teams and for soccer in Canada. And it turns out that resolution, at least in the short term, would be to threaten the players with legal action and potentially millions of dollars in damages. In a statement, Canada Soccer said, the players were not and are not in a legal strike position under Ontario labor law. So, after missing just one day of training, Christine Sinclair said this on social media, to be clear, we are being forced back to work for the short term. This is not over. So. Why don't the women's team and Canada soccer see eye to eye? After all, this doesn't sound like the kind of relationship you'd expect from a governing body and its reigning Olympic champions. Well, in one sense, it has everything to do with equity. The fact that Canada soccer is tightening its budget after the Men's World Cup, but before the women's. Umbrella view is that we we want the same budget that the men's national team was provided last year into their World Cup, um, which will in turn solve the problems that we've seen come from the budget cuts. Now, we know the men's and women's teams have not historically been treated equally. In 2021, Canada Soccer spent $11 million on the men's team, but only $5.1 million on the women's team. And according to Christine Sinclair, about half that amount actually came from Own the Podium, a Canadian nonprofit, not Canada Soccer itself. But this is as much about transparency. For years, both teams have been demanding a closer look at Canada Soccer's books. For as long as we've been fighting this fight, um, the CSA tends to hold their cards close and, and not share uh, what the budgets are for, for various programs. Um, and so we're constantly fighting blind. And so we've demanded a, a complete breakdown of the men's budget from last year. Uh, so, so we know what we're up against. And consider this statement from the men's national team, posted in solidarity shortly after the women first announced they were going on strike. Since June 2022, Canada Soccer has consistently refused or blatantly ignored our Players Association's requests for access to its financial records to back up its claims that it does not have the funds to properly operate Canada Soccer or fairly compensate the players and demands that it explain what has happened to millions of dollars that it should be receiving each year from sponsors and other sources. Now that last part about sponsors begins to hint at what might be one source of financial constraint on Canada soccer, why it's either unwilling or unable to give the players what they want. Canada soccer to me has not been transparent enough in where the money comes from and where the money goes. It's a public organization, it gets federal funding. Like, I don't understand how you can sort of be secretive about this. There's this really strange contract with Canadian soccer business, it's called, which is a private entity that also runs the Canadian Premier League. 
Canada Soccer, we know, is the governing body for soccer in Canada. Canada Soccer Business is a separate private company aligned with the Canadian Premier League, which is a men's domestic pro league. Canada Soccer and Canada Soccer Business have a multi-year deal in which Canada Soccer has given up its media and sponsorship rights in exchange for a guaranteed annual fee of between three and four million dollars per year. So what does that mean? Well, let's say Nike pays to use an image of Alfonso Davies or Christine Sinclair in an ad. Neither Canada Soccer nor the national teams see a single penny of that money. It all goes to Canada Soccer business and in turn, the men's domestic pro league. Canada Soccer says, hey, it's a guaranteed source of revenue and long term is about growing the game in this country. Critics wonder if Canada Soccer just made a bad deal at the players' expense, especially given how strong the two national teams are and how much those sponsorship deals could be worth. And the worst part, they say, that deal could be extended all the way to 2037. Are we really growing the game um, in, the, in the appropriate way? And I can't say we are. We are a small organization. Think of what we've done. We hosted a Women's World Cup that broke records. We had our women become Olympic gold medal champions that no one will ever take away as an outgrowth of a back-to-back -back bronze and bronze performance. And quite frankly, we've been asked to do more with less for the entire time all of us have been on this national team. And if we can go win a gold medal with what we've been given, I just can't imagine what this team can do if we're given the proper resources. But my job as president is a responsibility to the fiduciary and stable health of this organization, not just for the last 120 years that we've been alive, for the next 100 years they're going to be alive. And I can't accept an offer that will put our organization in a financial position that is untenable. So now we begin to see this labor dispute is no flash in the pan. It's a product of one side seeing the other as unrealistic, too demanding, and the other side perpetually asking, where's the money? <laughs>